It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. For comparative mythology, we're gonna talk about dying and rising gods. As you guys can see, I have like a lot and a lot and a lot of books. So what exactly do I mean when I say dying and rising gods? Obviously, there's going to be a lot of different variations of the stories that are not exactly the same because the stories are different from culture to culture. But essentially what I mean when I say a dying and a rising god is that a god dies and basically just rises up from the dead. Now the first story that we're going to talk about comes directly from a collection of stories that is called Myths from Mesopotamia. The first story that we're going to talk about is called The Descent of Ishtar to the Underworld. Now according to the historical notes, it says right here that this particular story is like the oldest of the dying rising god stories. That is the first Akkadian story that was first attested in the late Bronze Day period. This right here is an image of what Ishtar looks like. Now contrary to popular belief, the whole entire idea of Ishtar was not a divine inspiration for Easter at all, but rather like Ishtar is actually a goddess of beauty, love, justice, and fertility. The story goes as follow. Ishtar's daughter of Sin was determined to go. The daughter of Sin was determined to go to the dark house, to the house which those enter cannot leave. On the road where traveling is one way only, to the house to those who enter are deprived of the light. Where dust is their food, clay is their bread, they see no light, they dwell in darkness. They are clothed like birds with feathers over the door and the vault the dust has settled. Ishtar, when she arrived at the gate, addressed her words to the gatekeeper of the gate. Here gatekeeper, open your gate for me. Open your gate for me to come in. If you do not open the gate for me to come in, I will smash the door and smatter the bolt. I will smash the doorpost and overturn the doors. I shall rise up the dead and shall eat the living. The dead shall outnumber the living. The gatekeeper made his voice heard and spoke. He said to great Ishtar, Stop, lady. Do not break it down. Let me go and let me report you to the queen. Her lips grew dark as the whim of a vessel. What brings her here to me? Has he excited her against me? Surely not, because I drink water with the Ankanaki. I eat clay for bread. I drink muddy water for beer. I had to sweep for young men forced to abandon their sweethearts. I had to sweep for girls. Run from their lover's lap for the infant child. I have to weep, expel before his time. Go, gatekeeper. Open your gate to her. Treat her according to the ancient rites. The gatekeeper went. He opened the gate to her. Enter, my lady. May Kuta give you joy. May the palace be happy to see you. He let her in, passed through the first door, but stripped off, and took away the great crown of her head. Gatekeeper, why have you taken away the crown of my head? Go in, my lady. Such are the rites of Demetrius of Earth. He led her through the second door, but stripped off and took away the rings from her ears. Gatekeeper, why have you taken away my earrings? Gatekeeper, why have you taken away the trickle pens at my breast? Go in, my lady. Such are the rites of Demetrius of Earth. He led her through the fifth door, but stripped off and took away the gurgle of the birthstones around her race. Gatekeeper, why have you taken away the gurgle of the birthstone around my race? Go in, my lady. Such are the rights of the mistress of earth. He led her through the sixth door, but stripped off and took away the bangles of her waist and ankles. Gatekeeper, why have you taken away the bangles from my waist and ankles? Go in, my lady. Such are the rights of the mistress of earth. He led her through the seventh door, but stripped off and took away the proud garment of her body. Gatekeeper, why are you taking away the proud garment of my body? Go in, my lady. Such are the rights of the mistress of earth. As soon as Ishtar went down to Kornigi, a witchy gal looked at her and trembled before her. Ishtar did not deliberate but leaned over. A witchy gal made her voice heard and spoke. 
address her word to Namter, go Namter of my, send out her sixty disease, Ishtar. Disease of the eyes to her eyes, disease of the arms to her arm, the disease of the feet to her feet, disease to the heart to her heart, disease of the head to her head, to every part of her and two. Ishtar has gone down to the earth and has not come back up again. As soon as Ishtar went down, no bull mounted a cow, no donkey impregnated a jenny, no young man impregnated a girl in the street, the young man slept in his private room, the girl slept in the company of her friends. Ah, in the wisdom of his heart, created a person, he created good looks in the playboy. Come, good looks, sit your face towards the gate, the seven gates shall be open before you. When she is relaxed, her moon will be lightened. Get her to swear to the oath to the great gods. Raise your hand. Pay attention to the water skin, saying, Hey, hey, my lady, let me give him the water skin that I may drink from it. Come, good looks, I shall curse you with a great curse. I shall decree you for a fate that will never be forgotten. Bread from the city's plot shall be your food. The city drain shall be your only drinking place. The spade of a city with your only standing place. The drunk tart and the thirsty shall slap your cheek. She addressed her work to Naptar. Go Naptar, decorate the dirt hold, stem with the coal, bring the Amanaki out and seat them on the golden thrones. Sprinkle Ishtar with the water of light and conduct her in my presence. Naptar went and decorated the step with coals, brought out the Amanaki, seated them on golden thrones, sprinkled Ishtar with the water of light, and brought her to her sister. He led her through the first door and gave back to the proud garment of her body. He went through the second door and gave back the bungles for the wrists and ankles. He let her go through the third door and gave back the gurgle of the birthstone around her waist. He led her through the fourth door and gave her back the stungle pins at her breast. He went through the fifth door and gave it back to the breast around her neck. He let her go through the sixth door and gave her back the rings for her ears. He let her go through the seventh door and gave it back to the great crown on her head. The second example of a dying and rising god comes directly from a book that's called Stories from Ancient Canaan. The god that is featured in the story is known as Baal, and he's actually known as a storm god according to the Canaanite religion. Now, according to data, we do know that Baal was actually the son of El and Ashura, and not just that, though, but they were all forming part of this divine council of 72 different gods. And we also know that Yahweh, the God of the Bible, happens to be the sibling of, of course, Baal. And so basically, all these gods form together as one giant council within the context of ancient Canaanite religion. We arrive at the lovely place at the beautiful fields at Death's Shore. We came upon Baal. He has fallen to the ground. Baal the Conqueror has died. The Prince, the Lord of the Earth, has perished. Lift Baal the Conqueror unto me. Son, the God's Taurus obey. She lift up Baal the Conqueror. She put him on Anet's shoulders. She brought him up to the heights of Zabhan. She weeped from him and buried him. She put him to a great pit in the earth. She slaughtered sixty wild oxen as an oblation for Baal the Conqueror. She slaughtered seventy pal oxen as an oblation for Baal the Conqueror. She slaughtered seventy sheep as an oblation for Baal the Conqueror. She slaughtered seventy deer as an oblation for Baal the Conqueror. She slaughtered seventy mountain goats as an oblation for Baal the Conqueror. She slaughtered seventy asses as an oblation for Baal the Conqueror. But if Baal the Conqueror lives, if the prince of the Lord of the Earth has revived, and the dream of El the Kind the Compassionate, and the vision of the Creator of the Creatures, the heaven rained down oil, that I will know that Baal the Conqueror lives, that the prince, the Lord of the Earth, has revived, and the dream of El the Kind the Compassionate, and the vision of the Creator of the Creatures, the heavens rained down oil, El the Kind the Compassionate was glad, he put his feet on the soul, his bow relaxed and he laughed. He raised his voice and declared, Now that I can sit back and relax, my heart inside can relax, for Baal the Conqueror lived, the Prince of the Earth is alive. Another example of a dying and rising god comes directly from Greek mythology, and that dying and rising god 
happens to be Dionysus. Now, according to Greek mythology, Dionysus actually was split into many pieces, and once he was put together, he basically came back to life, and then he later ascended to heaven. At Hera's orders, the Titans seized Zeus's newly born son, Dionysus, a horned child, crowned with serpents, and, despite his transformations, tore him into shreds. These they boiled in a cauldron, while a pomegranate tree sprouted from the soil where his blood had fallen. But, rescued and reconstituted by his grandmother Rhea, he came to life again. Persephone, now entrusted with his charge by Zeus, brought him to King Athamas of Orchomenus and his wife Eno, whom she persuaded to rear the child in the women's quarters, disguised as a girl. But Hera could not be deceived, and punished the royal pair with madness, so that Athamas killed their son Laerces, mistaking him for a stag. Then, on Zeus's instructions, Hermes temporarily transformed Dionysus into a kid or a ram, and presented him to the nymphs Macris, Nysa, Erato, Bromie, and Bacchae of Heliconian Mount Nysa. They tended Dionysus in a cave, cosseted him, and fed him on honey, for which service Zeus subsequently placed their images among the stars, naming them the Hyades. It was on Mount Nysa that Dionysus invented wine, for which he is chiefly celebrated. When he grew to manhood, Hera recognized him as Zeus's son, despite the effeminacy to which his education had reduced him, and drove him mad also. He went wandering all over the world, accompanied by his tutor Silenus and a wild army of satyrs and maenads, whose weapons were the ivy-twinned staff tipped with a pine cone, called the Thrysus, and swords and serpents and fear-imposing bull-roarers. He sailed to Egypt, bringing the vine with him, and at Pharos, King Proteus received him hospitably. Among the Libyans of the Nile Delta opposite Pharos were certain Amazon queens, whom Dionysus invited to march with him against the Titans and restore King Ammon to the kingdom from which he had been expelled. Dionysus's defeat of the Titans and the restoration of King Ammon was the earliest of his many military successes. He then turned east and made for India. Coming to the Euphrates, he was opposed by the king of Damascus, whom he flayed alive, but built a bridge across the river with ivy and vine, after which a tiger, sent by his father Zeus, helped him across the river Tigris. He reached India, having met with much opposition by the way, and conquered the whole country, which he taught the art of viniculture, also giving it laws and founding great cities. On his return he was opposed by the Amazons, a horde of whom he chased as far as Ephesus. A few took sanctuary in the temple of Artemis, where their descendants are still living. Others fled to Samos, and Dionysus followed them in boats, killing so many that the battlefield is called Panhema. Near Phloem, some of the elephants which he had brought from India died, and their bones are still pointed out. Next, Dionysus returned to Europe by way of Phrygia, where his grandmother Rhea purified him of the many murders he had committed during his madness, and initiated him into her mysteries. He then invaded Thrace, but no sooner had his people landed at the mouth of the river Strymon than Lycurgus, king of the Edonians, opposed them savagely with an ox goad and captured the entire army, except Dionysus himself, who plunged into the sea and took refuge in Thetis's grotto. Rhea, vexed by this reverse, helped the prisoners to escape and drove Lycurgus mad. He struck his own son Dryas dead with an axe, in the belief that he was cutting down a vine. Before recovering his senses, he had begun to prune the corpse of its nose and ears, fingers and toes, and the whole land of Thrace grew barren in horror of his crime. When Dionysus, returning from the sea, announced that this barrenness would continue unless Lycurgus were put to death, the Adonians led him to Mount Pangeum, where wild horses pulled his body apart. 
Dionysus met with no further opposition in Thrace, but travelled on to his well-beloved Boeotia, where he visited Thebes, and invited the women to join his revels on Mount Cithiron. Pentheus, king of Thebes, disliking Dionysus's dissolute appearance, arrested him, together with all his menads. But he went mad, and instead of shackling Dionysus, shackled a bull. The menads escaped again, and went raging out upon the mountains, where they tore calves in pieces. Pentheus attempted to stop them, but, inflamed by wine and religious ecstasy, they rent him limb from limb. His mother Agave led the riot, and it was she who wrenched off his head. At Orchomenus, the three daughters of Minyas, by name Alcithoe, Loisippe and Arsippe, or Aristippe or Asinoe, refused to join in the revels, though Dionysus himself invited them, appearing in the form of a girl. He then changed his shape, becoming successively a lion, a bull, and a panther, and drove them insane. Loisippe offered her own son Hippasus as a sacrifice. He had been chosen by Lot, and the three sisters, having torn him to pieces and devoured him, skimmed the mountains in a frenzy until at last Hermes changed them into birds, though some say that Dionysus changed them into bats. The murder of Hippasus is annually atoned at Orchomenus in a feast called Agriona, provocation to savagery, when the women devotees pretend to seek Dionysus and then, having agreed that he must be away with the muses, sit in a circle and ask riddles, until the priest of Dionysus rushes from his temple with a sword and kills the one whom he first catches. When all Boeotia had acknowledged Dionysus's divinity, he made a tour of the Aegean islands, spreading joy and terror wherever he went. Arriving at Icaria, he found that his ship was unseaworthy, and hired another from certain Tyrrhenian sailors who claimed to be bound for Naxos. But they proved to be pirates, and, unaware of his godhead, steered for Asia, intending to sell him there as a slave. Dionysus made a vine grow from the deck and enfold the mast, while ivy twined about the rigging. He also turned the oars into serpents, and became a lion himself, filling the vessel with phantom beasts and the sound of flutes, so that the terrified pirates leapt overboard and became dolphins. It was at Naxos that Dionysus met the lovely Ariadne, whom Theseus had deserted, and married her without delay. She bore him Anopion, Thoas, Staphylus, Atromis, Euanthes, and Tauropolis. Later he placed her bridal chaplet among the stars. From Naxos he came to Argos and punished Perseus, who at first opposed him and killed many of his followers by inflicting a madness on the Argive women. They began devouring their own infants raw. Perseus hastily admitted his error and appeased Dionysus by building a temple in his honour. Finally, having established his worship throughout the world, Dionysus ascended to heaven, and now sits at the right hand of Zeus as one of the twelve great ones. The self-effacing goddess Hestia resigned her seat at the high table in his favour, glad of any excuse to escape the jealous wranglings of her family, and knowing that she could always count on a quiet welcome in any Greek city which it might please her to visit. Dionysus then descended, by way of Lerna, to Tartarus, where he bribed Persephone with a gift of myrtle to release his dead mother, Semele. She ascended with him into Artemis's temple at Troizen. But lest other ghosts should be jealous and aggrieved, he changed her name and introduced her to his fellow Olympians as Thyone. Zeus placed an apartment at her disposal, and Hera preserved an angry but resigned silence. The second to last example comes directly from the tales of ancient Egypt. When Osiris came to the throne, the Egyptians were cannibals and lived more like wild animals than human beings. All of this he and Isis alter very soon, teaching mankind to sow and weep both wheat and barley to make bread, 
how to grow various fruits such as the date and the grape for food and wine, how to make laws and live in peace under them, and how to do due honor to the gods and build temples for them. The first and greatest being that of Armin Wall. Osiris left Isis to rule over his and set out to teach the men and women in distinct parts. He took no army with him, but only a brand of priests and musicians, and even the wildest tribes hearkened to his kindly words and were won over by the streets to reign of music. Not all men, even in Egypt, follow Osiris. However, there was evil awake in the world to strike against good, and that in Egypt that evil was found in his leader, and Set, the younger brother of Osiris and Isis. Set would rebel and sets the storm while Osiris was away from Egypt on his mission, but Isis kept such good watch that he knew he would have no success, so he pretended to be a faithful subject and a loving brother of Pharaoh. But he gathered secretly to him 62 wicked women, all of which whom were ready to join a conspiracy against Osiris, and to them he added Azo, the queen of Ethiopia, who was sent on a visit to the court of Tibis. As soon as Osiris returned, Set invited him to a great fest which he had prepared in honor of his brother. Suspicioning nothing, Osiris came unattended and was welcomed by Set and his 72 companions. It was a very splendid fest during for which all the guests veiled with the others to do honor to Osiris. At last it was drawing to a close, Set said, We all pay our tributes to praise to my beloved brother, the good god Pharaoh Osiris. Now to end the fest, I have a gift for one of my guests, but this time I do not know who it will be. Set clapped his hand and his servants brought into the hall a most beautiful chest made of cheddar wood for Libyan and ebony from Ethiopia. When it was placed in the midst of the guests, the servants retired, the doors of the hall were shut, and Seth spoke again. Here is my gift to one of my guests. It shall be his who fit the most perfectly in the chest. All were admiring its beauty with cries of delight, and now they began one by one to see how well each of them fitted into it. But some were too tall, and some were too short, some were too fat, and others too thin. Let me try, said Osiris at last. He stepped into the chest and laid down, and it fitted him perfectly for Set, had secretly attained the exact measurement of his brother's body. It is mine, cries Osiris. See, it fit me like a skin I was born in. It is certainly yours, answered Set, and is fit to be the coffin you shall die in. So he slammed down the lid with fevious haste. Meanwhile, Isis learned what happened and set out in search of the body of Osiris. When the ship reached Egypt, Isis guided it to where the floating island was waiting for her, and blade of soldiers set the coffin in the shore. As soon as it was done, she stood beside it. She blade the soldiers right home to Bablos as fast as they would, and she set a wind to help them on their way. But she herself floated up to the Nile on the island, where Buto was still guarding the infant Horus and hid among the reeds of the delta until she can perform the funeral rites of Osiris. However, her crest by no means was an end, for on the very next day, Set and his followers came hunting through the darkness and moonlight, for Set best loved the hours of darkness when evil wandered the earth. As ill luck as it would have been, she came to the island that seemed to be part of the firm earth. Isis hid with, with horrors down deep among the reefs and escaped his notice. But he saw the chest that had been the coffin of Osiris and he once recognized it. With a great howl of rage and hate, he snatched the body of his murdered brother out the chest, tore it into fourteen pieces, and scattered them far and wide over the land of Egypt. He went on his way laughing, but Isis crept out of her hiding place, entrusted Horus once more to Bruto, and set out again for the search of the pieces of her husband's body. As she wrote Henter and Stenner on the Nile on her boat made of Pipus, the very crocodiles took pity on her and let her pass, and ever since anyone sailing on the Nile in a Pipus boat has been saved from the crocodiles, who was thinking still Isis searching for the last piece of the body of, of Osiris? For she found all but one piece, which has fallen into the Nile and has been eaten by certain fishes who were cursed forever after. But the other pieces he found with the help of 
Amburis, the son of Set and the other person, was took the shape of a wild dog in order to help her better in the search. Whatever his earthly burial, once it was accomplished, duh, the spirit of Osiris passed on. There he became the king of the dead, welcoming all of those whom the judges of the dead found worthy to enter his kingdom. The final example are the four gospel accounts about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 16, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Solomon brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week when the sun has risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the tomb was rolled back, it was very large, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Don't be afraid, you see Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen, he is not here. See the place where they lied him, but go, tell his disciples and Peter that he was going to you in Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went over and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Mark chapter 28 Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes while as snow. Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn and the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes was white as snow, and for the fear of him the guards tumbled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you see Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lie. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going to see you to Galilee. There you will see him. See how I told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and went to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took the feet of his and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to him, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and they will see me. Now this comes directly from Luke chapter 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone well away from the tomb, but they went if they would not have found the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were pixelated about this, behold, two men stood beside him in dazzling of power, and as soon as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to him, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of the sinful man, and be crucified, and third day rise. And they remember his words, and returning from the tomb, they told these things to eleven and all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, and Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and the other women, who told these signs to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an endy tale, and did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, snooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Now John chapter 20. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone has been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have lied them. So Peter went out and the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other swooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. 
He saw the lion linen laying down there, and the face cloth, which has been Jesus heard, not lying within the linen clothes, but folded up in place by itself. Then the other disciple, who has reached the tomb first, also went in, and saw and believed, for as yet they cannot understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. As you guys can see, the accounts of the resurrection completely contradict each other. Not just that though, but since Mark was like the earliest of the bunch, it seems as though that we can also see the gradual evolution of Mark into John because the stories about the resurrection become more and more and more fantastical as the years go by. But what do you guys think about these stories about rising and dying guys? Tell me in the comment section down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.